This early morning, we could explore an excerpt of Yong Jia Xuan Jue's Song of Enlightenment, and then meditate. This is Lama Jigme Gyatso of the Buddha Joy Meditation School. Welcome to Meditate Like a Jedi, which is brought to you by the kind folks who support this channel on Patreon. This morning, we could chant and meditate and enjoy a lesson or two, but first... If you love Star Wars, and you wish to meditate as, transform as transformatively as General Leia Organa upon Ajahn Kloss under the guidance of Luke Skywalker, be sure to subscribe and ring that notification bell. Good news. If at any point during this morning's live stream you have a specific question about Buddhist meditation or Buddhist philosophy or how to apply them to your life, simply type that question in great detail in the chat window on the right-hand side of your screen. I'll be glad to answer it for you. In the, this morning's mad rush, I did not get the chance to enter in some chanting notation, which I'm going to do right now. Once we awaken to the Tathagatas and the Six Noble Deeds, and the Ten Thousand Good Actions are already complete within us. So this is a delightfully poetic way of explaining. That in our enthusiasm to do good through the lens of being rigid and fearful and controlling, Newbies are often taught to be masters of minutia, which creates an analog of spirituality. The great irony is that when we become reasonably competent with the Buddha's meditation technique, the same one we're going to play play with in just a few minutes, when we become reasonably competent with that, then we do the right thing effortlessly. Let us pretend there are two extremes in a happy medium. The first extreme is being completely contrived, buttoned down with an agenda. The second extreme would be completely scattered, like a kid who ate real chocolate and then span around like a top for three minutes. The middle ground is another place of scattered spontaneity, but centered spontaneity, which is the effortless byproduct of truly and a, a truly effective practice of mindfulness and meditation. When we do that, our, we find that our choices and our utterances and our deeds flow effortlessly from the place of centered spontaneity. It has been said by the highest Tibetan yogis that the highest love, the greatest love, is spontaneous and uncontrived. If you, need to, if you feel you need to force love, probably it's because you're using an ineffective form of meditation that's exciting your fear and aggression center. The truly effective meditation will excite your empathy center effortlessly. 
by flowing from this place of centered spontaneity. As we are told in the Tao Te Ching, by doing nothing, there is nothing that is left undone. By abandoning the frenzy of scatteredness and contrivance and calmly flowing through centered spontaneity, everything gets taken care of in its own way, in its own time. The idea is reiterated in the final quatrain of the third chapter. Please chant with me. In all dream we see, in all dream we see the six levels of illusion clearly. After we awaken, the whole universe is empty. Once again, this is figurative. If you take it literal, you'll just give yourself a headache. <laughs> so, there is dreaming, and there is awakening. The duality of dream and dreaming and awakening is a common trope in Buddhism. And once again, newbies with the best of intentions often fall into the trap because of bad teachers to become masters of minutia, which is merely an analog of spirituality. If you ever seen the Omnimores Dilemma, they, can, they introduced a really wonderful idea. They showed a, a picture-perfect what appears to be a picture-perfect tomato. And they said, this is not a tomato. This is an analog of tomato. It looks like a tomato, but it doesn't smell like a tomato, and it doesn't taste like a tomato. But you sure you can't find it in your grocery store for a reasonable price. Then they go to a, a real tomato, and it, it's a little bit flawed, and it smells amazing, and it tastes even better. So becoming a master of minutia is an analog of spirituality. When we wake up, when we, the enlightenment the Buddha offers us is simply the mastery of the Eightfold Path. Liberation is the practice of the Eightfold Path. Enlightenment is the mastery of the Eightfold Path, which, according to the Buddha, can be accomplished in about a week. Mastery just means we're so good at something that we practice it spontaneously, habitually, easily, and effectively. So, when we are still deluded, when we're still basically a slave to our own turmoil, um, then we major in minors and think that the minors are terribly important, like, you know, trivia. And we might become an expert at trivia. But when we awaken, all that stuff we thought was important can feel as if it was as non-graspable as the infinite azure sky on a bright and beautiful cloudless morn, which although could be tantalizing to the eye, is intangible to the fingers. Now, that doesn't mean we become aloof and we no longer care about others. It means we care people from a place of great centeredness. We f still feel a full spectrum of human emotions. Anyone who tells you otherwise has taken a wrong turn in Albuquerque. It's like Bugs Bunny says Daffy Duck and one of many Merry Melodies. Um, <laughs> remember, the mark, 50% of the Eightfold Path pertains to love. 
the highest love is spontaneous and uncontrived. So if we are aloof or contemptuous, we have missed the path. But a hint that we're on the path is that the minutia of trivia, uh, doctrinal trivia, seems an absurdity to us. If you've just joined me, welcome aboard. Good news. The moment you have a question about Buddhist uh, meditation or Buddhist philosophy or how to apply them, you can type your question into the chat window and I'll be delighted to answer that question for you as soon as it captures my attention. So this is a very easy practice. There's only two chants. They're like bookends on a shelf. The opening chant and the closing chant. The opening chant, we're just going to stimulate the neural pathways that support our empathy and enthusiasm. We do that by performing this, chanting these four lines three times. Please join me. May I liberate all beings from... The tyranny of hate and craving and clinging by relying on the Buddha's example, instructions, and students. May I liberate all beings from the tyranny of hate and craving and clinging by relying on the Buddha's example, instructions, and students. May I liberate all beings from the tyranny of cra hate and craving and clinging by relying on the Buddha's example, instructions, and students. Now, I'm really out of it this morning, so what I'm going to do is just knock out three uh, geriatric step-back squat thrusts in front of a Buddha statue. You don't have to follow along with me, but if you want to, you are most certainly welcome. Example instructions and students. May I liberate all beings from the tyranny of crave, hating, craving, and clinging, but relying on the Buddhas. Example instructions and students. So there's nothing supernatural with that. There was nothing supernatural with that. It's just a fun way to blend exercise with loving intentions. I, one of my friends refers to it as enlightened fitness. Let's see. Let's tap button nine. To paraphrase a line from Braveheart, if you're an old G like me, you may remember that movie. That'll wake you up first thing in the morning. We're going to practice mindfulness and meditation. It is known by many names, such as Zen, John, Jhana, Maha. Um, Mahamudra, Ati Yoga, Dzogchen, Treksho, and 
slice through. It's also known as the highest form of tonfeta. And despite that, it's remarkably easy. Sit like you can, like this gentleman, and sit as best you can, like this gentleman pictured on the screen before us. As we breathe in, silently and mentally recite the demonstrative pronoun this. As you exhale, physically, uh, silently and mentally recite the hyphenated verb relaxing. Very, very simple. How can something simple be effective? The great irony is that every educated idiot thinks that is happy to make things more complicated, more difficult, and more violent. But it takes a lot of courage, I'm sorry, and a little bit of genius to move in the opposite direction. Every time we breathe in, our autonomic nervous system, we access our autonomic nervous system, which has evolved to perceive, not concentrate, but perceive or notice vulnerably, passively, viscerally, and randomly. We can notice all sorts of stuff, that which is external or internal, physical or mental, pleasurable or painful, interesting or boring, glorious or grotesque. What do we do with that stuff? Well, every time we breathe out, we access our parasympathetic nervous system, which has evolved to both physically relax and mentally release. How do we mentally release? By physically relaxing. How do you physically relax? by allowing your body to do what it's already programmed to do during each exhalation. Why bother meditating at all if this is already a function of our autonomic nervous system? Simple. We are aligning our will, our volition, our intention with the mechanisms of our factory-installed wiring. It's just that simple. And now you understand the demystification of Soto Zen's or Kao Dong Chan's figurative aphorism to just sit. There are two steps to enlightenment, liberation and enlightenment. Liberation is just learning the skill set, you know, and, and acclimating to practice. For instance, most people aren't ready to just meditate for 60 minutes the first time, but they can do it for five minutes. And so they practice for uh, meditating for five minutes once every 12 hours. After, after a week, they're ready to bump it up to 10 minutes. And after two weeks, they're ready for 15 minutes. And after three weeks, they're ready for 20 minutes. And so forth and so on until after... Um, I forgot what the number is. I guess it's uh, 12 weeks. After, by your 13th week, you could have acclimated to 60 minutes of practice once every 12 hours. And because it's taking place over three or four months, that's gradual and gentle. So 
that's what I call cruising speed or um, liberation. Uh, assuming that you've learned, you know, how to practice and stuff like that. The next step is simply enlightenment. And that can be done in as little as a week. So the whole path can be accomplished in less than a year without quitting your job, without leaving your partner, without neglecting your pet. Typically, between liberation and enlightenment, people learn how to play with the idea of a retreat. A retreat is simply practicing four times a day instead of twice a day. So many people start off with a one-day retreat, and they might practice at 6 a.m., 10 a.m., 2 p.m., and 6 p.m. They might practice twice a day with the live stream, live or recorded, and twice a day by themselves. It's practicing by yourself that you really see the flaws in your armor and are able to jot down questions that you're able to bring to your teacher and get them answered. And when someone's comfortable with a one-day retreat or a two-day retreat, then the next time they have a paid vacation, they can do a seven-day retreat. They don't have to go anywhere special. They can do it at home. Their pets and partners and children if, will come to love it when they do a one-day retreat because during their meditation breaks, the participant is just so much more attentive to their family and their partner and their pets. So this, this is rigorous, but it's not impossible. It's not just for the elite. Anybody, even the differently abled, such as myself, can do this path. But to borrow a phrase from our friends and the 12-step program, it works. If you work it, so work it.
many people, many cultures teach that it's important to be elitist. A few practice egalitarianism. Those who are elitist hate the fact that the most effective meditation is also the easiest. Because it's tough to have bragging rights if you've mastered something easy. But if I have to choose between enlightenment and bragging rights, I'll choose enlightenment. How about you? Let me know in the comment area. So remember, we are wired to notice things when we breathe in. We're breathing in when we're saying the silently and mentally reciting the word this, and it's shorter, sharper, and we are relaxing during our exhalation that while silently and mentally reciting relaxing, and that recitation is longer and softer. So sharp, soft, short, longer. And we could find ourselves noticing all kinds of things. We can notice sights, sounds, sensations, flavors, scents, and the like. We could emote, intend, reason, recall, and imagine. It's not our job to choose those. It's not our job to flee from those. It's not our job to label those. The only label we need is the uh, demonstrative pronoun, this. And you might ask, how can I relax in the presence of sorrow or rage or terror? And the answer is, those things suck. But what makes them worse is that we resist them. So what we're really letting go of is our resistance to the suckiness, which makes the suckiness suck less, which sounds some, something like a tongue twister. We are none of us literally omniscient. We do not know the battle that our fellows are fighting between their ears. Therefore, it behooves us to just give people the benefit of the doubt. Not because they're awesome, but because we realize that we just don't know everything about everyone. Sometimes it's good to question whether that behavior of others that seems malicious might just be ignorant. It might not be. It might be malice. But it's good to question ourselves, to question our certitude. Certitude is the enemy of wisdom.
There is a myth that our task is to transcend the duality of dread and desire, pulling and pushing. It's not. It's our task to transcend their tyranny. Those drives are part of our brain. They will be there. The question is whether they are the boss of us or not. It's like that song, the chorus of the song by the group that may be giants. You're not the boss of me now and you're not that big. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Most of us do not make it out of childhood without scars. When a traumatic memory surfaces, we notice it as we breathe in, we physically relax as we breathe out, 
and the natural mechanisms of our autonomic nervous system help us to heal. If you feel like you're in the midst of a full-blown panic attack, then during your inhalation, close your right eye, gaze through your left. During your exhalation, close your left eye, gaze through your right. Doing so can create an autonomic reset, which can be helpful. Another thing we could do is tie, tap alternate elbows or alternate kneecaps, go for a brisk walk. These things will also create a sur serve to stimulate an autonomic reset. If you are practicing with a meditation group and someone tells you that someone takes umbrage with you trying to self-regulate during a panic attack or a PTSD episode, then their person probably isn't a good companion for you. And if the teacher if the majority of the teacher's students are like that, then that's not a very good teacher. So if people reject you for meeting your basic needs, you haven't lost companions. You've lost fools and fiends masquerading as friends. Remember the troubling statement attributed to the Buddha. Better to walk the path alone than in the company of a fool. I've met monsters in monks' clothing and in nuns' clothing. I've met monsters who thought that they were Christians or Jews or Muslims. Some people are fools. Some people are monsters. Some aren't. Some are just really good people trying to do their best and trying to be as kind as to others. And if you go through life and you collect a small group of those people who are just kind, decent people, then you're fortunate.
Welcome to the live stream. During our short inhalation, we silently and mentally recite the demonstrative pronoun this. During our longer exhalation, we silently and mentally recite the hyphenated verb relaxing. When you have a question about Buddhist meditation or Buddhist philosophy or how to apply them, type your question in the chat window.
Let's seal our practice with a bit of the old wishing love in the template of the four immeasurables. May everyone be free from suffering, may everyone be happy. May no one be separated from the happiness. May everyone have balance from the tyranny of hating, craving, and clinging freed. If you feel that I have earned it, you could type something in the chat window. You could give this live stream a thumbs up. You could share it with a friend. You could support this channel on Patreon. The choice is yours. I leave it to you. In approximately two and a half hours, I would very much like to return to lead today's mid-morning meditation. Until then, may you and yours be happy and healthy. And... If you are as geeky as me, this is the way. <laughs>